1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 to 20. This is a part two. We focused on verses 12 to 14 before, and we're going to look specifically at 15 to 20 today, although the ideas are throughout this passage. So it really is kind of part two of, of verses 12 to 20. And the title of the sermon, I can just read to you out of uh, the Bible in verse 20, glorify God in your body. Glorify God in your body. And that means that what you do with your schedule, where you go, activities you participate in, the thoughts that you think and dwell on, the words that you say, uh, <clears throat> that's important. That either glorifies God or it doesn't. Now let's not be mistaken here. We do not add to or take away from the quantity, if you want to think of it that way, of the glory of God. He is an infinitely glorious being, and it will be demonstrated, it has been demonstrated, it is being demonstrated, and will be finally demonstrated that no rebellion among his creatures will rob him of that. He's going to settle all accounts. The ledger will balance and the end result is that the universe will, will recognize God is glorious. In fact, specifically, we are promised both in the Old Testament and the New Testament books that every knee will bow. And we get the detail in the, in the New Testament, in the apostolic writings, that the Messiah, Jesus, uh, to him, uh, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. And, and so don't think, please don't misunderstand and think that what we're saying today is that the glory of God depends on you and your behavior. It, has an, it, it, it is set in the person of Him. You can't take away any of it. You could try. Satan is doing that. He's been doing it since his fall. And he's unsuccessful at that and will be unsuccessful and will spend his eternity in the lake of fire prepared for him and his angels along with all the others who say, not seeing anything particularly glorious about God. This is crucial that you see and understand that God is glorious because that's the only motivation for you to obey the commands here. And in fact, I would go ahead and say... If God is not glorious, then use your body however you want to. Go where you want to, sleep with who you want to, do what you want to, disregard God. If he is not the glorious God that is portrayed in Scripture. But you know why we're here today. <laughs> you know why this building exists, why there's a pulpit, why there's a man here speaking to you. It's because God is glorious. His word is true. This is reality. And you better heed it. Now, let's see what Paul wrote to the Corinthians about the issue of how they use their bodies in this life. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 20. The Bible says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but... I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, 
for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Father, we need your spirit to illuminate this truth to us so that we have understanding. Oh God, when it comes to this issue in our society, it's harder to get an issue that shows more clearly the opportunity to glorify you and live for your, for your glory versus doing whatever we want to do for our own selfish reasons. So Lord, help us all to understand this and submit to your command with joy because you are a God worthy of our obedience and service. Help us to see this, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Certainly in our society over the last few decades, something has been going on uh, that some have called a moral revolution, some have called a sexual revolution. And uh, basically what it gets to is that now we have uh, entities, businesses, corporations, and the demand is this. The demand is this. You are evil if you don't think that a person has the right to sleep with whoever they want to and decide who they will love and how they will love them. That's the message today. Our country, the society, that's a tremendous change. Tremendous change from the base of our laws and, and, and the way we viewed right and wrong. You see, it used to be in this country uh, that uh, there was an idea that the laws should be based on what is right and what is wrong, transcending humans. We look above us and we, we make our law book based on what is right and what is wrong, transcendentally. In other words, according to God. That is why... Our society has been stable and has flourished uh, beyond more than what we deserve just because of that truth that we recognize there is such thing as right and wrong. Today, there's no longer the idea that right and wrong is something that transcends us, but rather it's individual, relative, circumstantial. And the highest ambition for law would be the individual's personal gratification and satisfaction. If that's true, the Bible's not true. But that's not true, and the Bible is true. So Paul brings this up. He's already covered it in 1 Corinthians 5, the issue of sexual immorality. And you know, he doesn't spend much time talking about the actual sexual immorality. That passage, that chat, chapter, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 13, where he introduces a situation. His concern is not that sexual immorality is happening as much as the church is tolerating it. That the church of the Lord Jesus is saying, it's okay. It's all right. You know, if it makes them happy. It's, it is about making someone happy, if you'll take that in that sense. But it's God who we have to, to ask ourselves, is he happy with this? Is he pleased with this? Is he satisfied with this? So it really does come down to you either care about that or you don't. Another way to say it is you either love God or you don't. Now also in our society is this brilliant plan by the enemy, and the flesh is, is a accomplice to this, to reject that and say, oh, no, 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 that's not it at all. This is just the way I love God. I love God in this way. You may love God in that way, but I love God in this way. And we do not consult the God who we're claiming to love. And it turns out, he has spoken on this issue. He has spoken on the issue of, of sexual behavior. As a matter of fact, it was his idea. Do you know that? His idea. He created Adam and Eve. 
and he made them complementary to one another. And he blessed them with a physical capability to unite in such a way that was beyond physical and in, in, in spiritual. And he said the two will become one flesh. And that's important. And it's, it, it, it's obvious when we see no matter how many decades of the culture telling us you can have casual sex, no ramifications. And we see lives destroyed. We see people unable to move forward emotionally. We see damage. And yet the world continues to pull itself up limping and say, no, it's all great. This approach is fantastic. Collapsing, struggling, going to psychologists and psychiatrists and deeply depressed. It turns out this was God's idea, sexual behavior was, that you exist as a sexual being and he has a plan for it. And it matters whether or not you pursue that or your own agenda. It matters. And this is what Paul is saying. Here you are, you're claiming to be a church and you're not pursuing God's plan and you're tolerating those who say, we're not going to do that. You can't do that. I mean, he, he, he says it pretty clearly. The last verse of chapter 5 there, purge the evil person from among you. Uh, that's a quote from several places in Deuteronomy. Um, uh, he applies Mosaic law to this situation and says, the person who rejects God's instructions is an evil person. Now, by the way, that's all of us. <laughs> that's all of us. But in Christ, we're redeemed and reconciled to God. Now, this passage that we're looking at today is written to saved people. It's addressing saved people who know and have agreed to the message that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, and not according to works. It is not earned. Salvation is a free gift. But what they had done was to say, okay, okay, so my behavior does not earn or cancel out my salvation. It's just a free gift. It's unconditional. We're all sinners anyway. And so they put all that into a summary statement that we find in 1 Corinthians 6.12 that Paul quotes, all things are lawful for me. This is apparently a big deal because Paul brings it up again in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, this little motto that they had. Theological, yeah, but all things are lawful for me. And they're right in a sense in that keeping the law is not what determines whether or not you're saved or lost. You cannot reconcile yourself to God by keeping the law. So in the sense, the law's relationship to salvation, you could say, all things are lawful for me. I'm already a lawbreaker. I'm a lawbreaker anyway. But Paul shows how, what the effect of salvation, true salvation, that's by grace, through faith, in Christ, to the glory of God, in his next statement there in verse 12, their thing is all things are lawful for me. And he says, okay, in a sense I grant you that, but not all things are helpful. If you're a believer and you commit adultery, do you know that you don't lose your salvation? That's true, isn't it? You could say all things are lawful for me. But that's not helpful. That's not helpful. That's harmful and terrible. And has and you know what? The repentant adulterer, do you know what that person finds at the cross? Forgiveness. But ask a man who has stepped away from his family and a faithful wife and committed adultery if that was helpful. Even in the forgiveness, ask him, did that help you to have a good marriage? 
Did that gain for you the respect of your sons? It's not helpful, is it? I hope you understand God in His holiness issues His commands because they are right and because they conform to Himself. And they are clean and pristine and perfect and best for us. What a blessing. What a blessing. So there are those who would say, it doesn't matter what we do in our bodies, we're saved by grace anyway. Go ahead and then just ask God for forgiveness. Now that's dangerous. Um, that's about the worst plan I can think of for the all-powerful, all-knowing God, as if He doesn't already know your plan before you carry it out. So don't do that. You need to understand, like Titus 2 tells us, that the grace that saves us also teaches us how to live. So if you're truly saved, you're going to know I shouldn't do that because the grace of God teaches you in His Word and the Holy Spirit's conviction to you. You'll know. Another, another response, though, is more phil philosophical to our bodies. It's more like, um, well, I got a good illustration. Was it yesterday? Um, I saw a clip from The Empire Strikes Back. And Yoda told Luke uh, that he was messing up when he was trying to use the Force because he was too concerned with the physical, basically. He pinched his shoulder and says, don't focus on this matter. It doesn't matter. That's of who we are. But we are not created to exist as, as immaterial beings. We are created with a body. And God said it is very good. So I believe that we need to understand ourselves as a conditional unity of immaterial and material. Now we learn from 1 Corinthians 15 that this particular material, this version of my body is not fit for heaven. I am not fit for the glory of God because this flesh is contaminated by the fall. And so that's why I have to have rules and laws and regulations to learn how I can live a holy life because that does not come natural to me. When I do what comes natural with all the urges, desires, appetites, when I respond to my circumstances just naturally, that's that's, a, that's wicked and sinful. I have to be taught. I have to understand. I have to learn. I have to know God. One day I'm going to have a body that when I just do what comes naturally, I glorify God. Because I'm going to have a body, glorified body, fit for His immediate presence. A body in which I can dwell near God. Right now, I have this body, and I have an opportunity. And, and in our society, we've never, had, we've never been in a time where how we use our bodies is more clearly either loving God or hating God. So let's think about three things. The Christian's proper attitude, the Christian's position, and the Christian's proper action. Christian's proper attitude, the Christian's position, which is described in verse, uh, verses 19 and 20. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. If you're a Christian, you are not your own. Well, if we can get that down, that'll help us. <laughs> that'll help us a lot. Well, if I'm not my own, whose am I? Well, you're the Lord's. And He has a plan for how you live your life. And it's not you who decides that, it's him. So the Christian's position and the Christian's proper action, which is glorify God in your body. So let's think about these things. Christian's proper attitude. Uh, there are three ideas that we have to ha have from this passage. First of all, the Christian's body is for the Lord. Secondly, the Christian's body is a member of Christ. A member of the body of Christ. And thirdly, the Christian's body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's what's going on right now, even in your body that you have right now, that, you know, we should notice 
Some of you may have noticed, if you're old enough, I think you have noticed, that our bodies are not improving with age. Okay, that points to the temporary nature. This is not eternal, you know, and I praise God for that. Uh, That's on display for us. And yet, in this body, it is important how I use it, how I use this body, no matter how old you are today. Because my body is for the Lord, my body is a member of the body of Christ, and my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's let's, Let's understand this. I want to read to you Romans 6, 11 to 12, and then Romans 12, 1 and 2. Romans 6, 11 to 13, rather. Romans 6, 11 to 13. The Bible says, You also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. That is the members of your body. Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, famous, famous verses. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, I want you to look at this in Romans 12, 1 and 2. We are told to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. A sacrifice. We give it up. But they're not given up in a, in a, a, a ritual slaying uh, physically, but rather spiritually. We give them up and they're living bodies. They are living bodies. We give them up because we've been bought. How is this going to happen? Do not be conformed to this world. Okay, what would that look like? The word conform right there means being poured into a mold. Being poured into a mold. Listen, here's what you have to do in order to be conformed to the world. Now listen very closely so that you'll understand this. You ready? Nothing. Just float, man. Just just be you. That is your default setting since the fall of Adam in the garden. The problem is, the command here is, do not do that. (laughs) Don't follow the patterns of this world which shout at you, you can do whatever you want to do. The thing that they have to add, though, is, and then come the consequences. But you don't ever hear that part of the message. Well, how do you do that? How do you not be conformed? (laughs) Okay, here is the reason why we meet once a week in this room and, you know, either me or Pastor David or somebody comes out and talks to you from the Bible. How can we not be conformed to the patterns of this world, to the poured into the more of this world? What does it say? Be transformed by the renewal of your what? Mind. You got to know some stuff. And you got to know the right stuff. And God, by the way, this is not our idea. This is Jesus' idea. It says he gave pastor teachers. This is what we do to help you and to help all of us be transformed by the renewal of our minds by knowing who God really is, what his attributes are, what the gospel is, who we are, how we can be reconciled to him to know that. And then we can say, ah. I have a different goal than just the people out here floating in their sin. I've got a different purpose. I have a different objective. When we wake up in the morning, we have a different reason for existing. We display the grace of God and the resulting holiness when the creator of the universe takes up residence in the life of a rebellious sinner. So, our bodies for the Lord. Back in 1 Corinthians, 
He says it this way in verse 13. They say, yeah, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. Like, it's just a biological thing. And so when it comes to sexual immorality in the body, that's the, that, their thing was this. You got food, you got the stomach. You got the stomach, you got food. You've got the body, you've got sex. You've got sex, you've got the body. This is just temporal. Doesn't matter how we behave. That's not a spiritual issue. And he says, you are wrong. Yes, indeed. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. That means this body and the things that we do now and the way we live and exist now and what we have to have and what we don't have to have and all that, that's not going to be the same for that body. And the standard of right and wrong applies now already in this body even for what is temporal. But the, the clear teaching that we've got to get is the next statement. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, if you're a believer and you understand that, then everything that you do with your body, you should think of it this way. Dear Lord, I am about to fill in the blank for you. If you can't say that, don't do what it is that you're about to do. That helps me sometimes when there are gray areas. When I'm deciding, will I let my, will me and my family watch this movie or not? If I can't say, Lord, we're for you. We, we exist for you. We're about to take in profanity and a glorification of violence and immorality for your glory. That doesn't fit very well, does it? That's a nonsensical prayer. That's stupid. Anybody can figure that out. Lord, we're about to watch evil things for your glory. Okay. Now we're just evaluating, is this evil or not? That's the way we do it. Because our bodies are for the Lord. Now the second thing is the Christian's body is a member of Christ. A member of Christ. And this where... This is where Paul really hammers home why having a godly sexual ethic is important. Because you are not just an island if you belong to Christ. You are united to Christ. Look in verse 17. He who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. That's what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. Your body, think of your physical body right now. You have an immaterial part, your spirit. But it is, it is within, it is connected to somehow mysteriously all of your body. You don't think of yourself and then also your right heel. You don't think of that, do you? You don't get to do that either with the body of Christ. You don't get to say, the body of Christ is glorious and majestic, but I'm just kind of over here. I'm just, it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't affect the body. Well, if we took a hammer and hit your heel hard enough, you would say, you know, my whole body is affected by what happens to my right heel. Your mouth might go fly open, and your lungs might expel air going, oh, if we hit you hard enough with that. Ephesians 5.30, listen to this. This is as straightforward as it can be. We are members of his body. All right. Look at verse 15 in 1 Corinthians. Do, do you not know? This means you ought to know. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you know that you don't have the option as a believer of saying, Oh, Jesus, you stay over there. I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to be out. I'm going to be busy for a little while. But then I'll come back and we'll get back together. That's not an option. So what is the way that you can avoid joining Christ to a prostitute? Do not commit sexual immorality. That's the way you do it. That's the way. Because you know what? We are members of his body. 
And if I, and, and by the way, prostitute here is an example. And what you need to be understanding is anybody who would prostitute sexuality as given by God for their own personal desires and preferences. This is not necessarily a professional uh, prostitute situation. This is any, any sexual immorality. You, you can apply this. So you cannot commit sexual immorality as a Christian without actually involving the Lord Jesus. Why? Because do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? You know, it's interesting to me that there are probably a lot of people who would champion once saved, always saved. And then on the other hand, say, well, it's not that big a deal if I go and commit sexual immorality. It's not that big, big a deal if I sleep with my girlfriend before we get married. It's not that big a deal if I just disregard what Jesus says about it. Actually, what you're doing, if you're truly saved and you use your body to commit sexual immorality, is you are taking a member of the body of Christ and involving Christ's body in sexual immorality. That's what's being said here. This is why Paul starts the thing by going, Do you not know? Praise God, sexual immorality is not the unforgivable sin. Don't we need to remember, before we become too self-pious and judgmental, don't we remember, need to remember what Jesus said? What is the standard? For example, adultery. If you have lusted in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. Does God care about your heart? Yes, He does. I hope that this passage and that understanding right there will give you a greater appreciation of the grace and mercy of God. Remember the song we just sang a few minutes ago, Man of Sorrows, Jesus, the Creator, the agent of creation. John says nothing was made that He didn't make. And the Father, so impressed with Jesus and His incarnation and the mission that He did, has exalted Him to the highest possible place. All of that. And Jesus took the role of Man of Sorrows to redeem us from sin, including sexual immorality. So the Christian's body is a member of Christ. That's true. That's true. You are not free as a Christian to indulge in sexual immorality and think that doesn't really affect anybody else. The most important person it affects is Christ. Because we are the body of Christ. And this is important. This is important. It is written, the two will become one flesh. A sexual union is an important thing. C.S. Lewis said, a paraphrase, he said, if you have a sexual union with someone, that is something that you will either enjoy or endure for the rest of your life. Now think about that. If that's within the covenant of marriage, which is God's plan, then you can see how that's something to be enjoyed forever. But try getting married and saying, Sweetheart, I've been very promiscuous. And you'll understand what C.S. Lewis meant by now it has to be endured. Now, praise God, we can endure it. By the grace of God, there's forgiveness. If, if there were no grace and forgiveness, there'd be no reason for us to meet here. But there is. But those of us who have been saved, what Paul is saying to the people saying, I now belong to Jesus is, okay, here's how you live. Here's how you live in that forgiveness. Here's how you live. Proverbs 5, 15 to 19, lest you think that God is trying to stifle you. Proverbs 5, 15 to 19 encourages a man to enjoy physical intimacy with his own wife. Encourages a man to be one, one 
uh, translation says to be ravished, to be intoxicated with the beauty and the physical intimacy with your wife. Hebrews 13.4 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Listen, if you believe in God, you better hear this verse. Let marriage be held in honor among all. And by the way, marriage in this instance, there is no question, there is no doubt, it is certain that what this word means in the word of God is one man and one woman in a covenant relationship, okay? It's a man and a woman, okay? That's what the word meant here. When the writer of Hebrews wrote that, when the Holy Spirit inspired it, that's what it meant. And we cannot redefine that there in Scripture. The laws of the land may change, all that, but that doesn't have anything to do with this is what God says. Let marriage be held in honor among all. Are you, do you do that? Do you think marriage is important? And let the marriage bed be undefiled. That means you practice your expression of sexuality and you champion God's plan for it, which is that physical intimacy, sexual intimacy, is within the bounds of marriage. That's God's plan. That's how you can say, I'm hearing that and obeying it. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. Here's the warning. You say, ah, that's old-fashioned thinking. Ah, that's, that's not in step with the times. No, that's just kind of cramping my style. No, that's just not going to work for us. Do you not understand the tax benefits? Do you not understand the financial arrangement that I've got going on here? Do you not understand? You need to be reasonable at this. Here's what the Word of God says to you. God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. I don't have any authority to edit that or to tame it. I am called to proclaim to you, God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. And if you end up before the throne of God and this sin is brought against you and you say, I didn't understand it meant that. I didn't know. No, there's going to be this. No, no. It was proclaimed to you from my word. So heed that warning. This is what it means to be a believer or an unbeliever. See? This is what it means to either love God or hate God. This is, this is the dividing line. How do you live? How do you apply this? Well, glorify God in your sexual activity. Obey His plan and purpose for sexual activity. That is, engage in it only within a marriage covenant between a man and a woman. Third, the Christian's body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Christian's body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Verse 19a. Do you not know? You know what? Let me, I want to I say something about the verse before that. There's some, there's some uh, confusion maybe. It says, flee from sexual immorality. Flee from sexual immorality. <laughs> That's how dangerous it is. Get away from it. Are you tempted if you uh, get in a dark place alone with your boyfriend or girlfriend? And guess what? Don't go to a dark place alone with your boyfriend or girlfriend. That is the sophisticated strategy from the Word of God. Run! Can you think of an example in the Bible when somebody did that? Joseph. He did not, in that moment, say, now let's just think this through. Let's just be reasonable here. He ran. And let me just point out, you've heard of Joseph. He's famous. He's well known for living for the glory of God. Now, that doesn't mean if you run that you're going to be famous and people all around the world are going to know what a great Christian. But you know what it's going to mean? I don't know what your neighbor thinks about you, and I don't know what 
lost people are going to say, well, I, I pretty well know. But what I do know is this. It's going to be a great moment when the, when the accumulated worth of your life is measured by an almighty God. And he says, well done. may not matter to you very much now. You might have trouble thinking about that moment now. But in that moment, this moment will fade away as a vapor and nothing will matter except the joy of hearing Him say, Well done. Good and faithful servant. So, run. Flee. He says... Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. There's some different ideas. Well, what does that mean? Because suicide, for example, seems to be against your own body. Well, I think the reason what he just said is just to, to he's already explained it. Why is sexually, sexual immorality in a Christian so despicable? It's because you're involving Christ. Because you are a member of the body of Christ. And you cannot take a time out from that status while you go and sin. I believe that's why he's saying it's a sin against his own body. You, you are using your own body as the instrument for rebellion against God in a way that, well, you're joined spiritually to Christ, right? Right? Verse 17, he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. That means if you're saved, if you're saved, if you're a Christian, if you are regenerate, if you have been born again, you are a member of his body, you are one spirit with him. You have the Holy Spirit residing in you and you cannot separate from that status or change it or take a time out. And so when you use your body in a sexual sin, a union, a sexually immoral union, you are joined to Christ and you are now joining to that other person in a, such a way that mysteriously the Bible says the two become one flesh. And Jesus is participating in that. Now let me again say, it is not possible to sully or taint the character and the person of Jesus. But it is possible to grieve the Holy Spirit. And so, moving on now, the, the, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians 2.12 declares, we have received the Spirit who is from God. That's what it is to be saved. We have received the Spirit who is from God. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Paul says, Do you not know that you are God's temple, that God's Spirit dwells in you? Now listen to this warning. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Separate, set apart, not to do what everybody else does and just do whatever feels good. But you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's corporate there in chapter 3, but, but here we're talking about individually, your bodies. But it's corporate because we all individually have the same spirit. You see that? I affect, my behavior affects Desert Ridge Baptist Church. Because I'm part of the body of Christ, and you are too if you're saved, and my behavior matters. We together are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We individually are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, those of us who are saved. And so, he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. We're temples of the Holy Spirit. Let us not defile the temple of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 4a, there's one body and one spirit. One body and one spirit. Can't take a time out from that. How do you apply this? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 says, 
do not grieve the Holy Spirit. We can cause the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, who is indwelling us, to grieve. We must avoid this. Now listen. He already knows the plan. But this is what it is for him to be in a personal relationship with redeemed sinners. He does not save us and then say, whatever you do is fine with me. He redeems us and then tells us, here's how you live. Jesus taught this over and over. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? In Luke 6, 46. He said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Our American Christianity has labored. I've heard people, I've heard many explanations. What is the desire is this. No, 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 Lord. Don't pay attention to that behavior. Listen to what I'm telling you. I love you. But Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. No, no, no. I, the way I live doesn't have anything to do with my love for you. And what Jesus is saying, the way you live is your love for me or not. Our bodies, temples of the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 Do not quench the Spirit. Now this word quench means to suppress or to stifle. And here technically it means divine influence. You can suppress or stifle. What that means is you can listen or not. You can hear it and let it go in one ear and out the other, write it off and do what you want to do. And stifle the plan of the Holy Spirit of God for your life. Now, you know what you're doing when you're saying that? Here's what you're saying. Almighty, infinite God, who numbers the hairs on everyone's head, who is so sovereign that not a sparrow falls out of the sky apart from your will, I know better than you. That's what you're saying. To stifle and suppress divine influence. It might be that that divine influence is saying, don't go there. Don't go in there. And you know what? If that is the will of God and you go in there, nothing good apart from redemption and forgiveness can happen. There will be consequences. I had, uh, I heard an illustration that I thought summed it up very well about God's forgiveness and consequences. There was a, a piece of wood, and uh, well, let me just tell it to you this way: you can you can take nails and you can hammer the nails into a piece of wood, right? The other side of a claw hammer, you can slip on the either side of the nail and pull the nail out, right? And when you get finished doing that, nail, them, nail in six or seven, pull them out. The board looks exactly the same before you started, right? No. A bunch of holes where the nails were, right? That's the way sin is. And forgiveness, the forgiveness is there. But those holes will be there too. That divine influence, the Holy Spirit, He wants what's best, first of all, for God... And it just so happens that what's best for God is best for you. What a blessing. Now, I decided, by the way, several minutes ago that I'm going to have to leave some of this off because I cannot rush through you are not your own, you're bought with a price. I just can't because that is so wonderful. So if you're saying to yourself, wow, he has kind of uh, really hammered on this sexual immorality, yeah, because it's crucial and clear in Scripture. And everywhere else you go, you get the opposite message. So I wanted to be clear and direct today because if you go to the library or the fire department, they won't tell you this. So we're, we're doing it now. But don't miss, if you can be here next week or listen online or whatever you need to do, or just read it and study it for yourself, don't miss 
You were bought with a price. You are not your own. We need to understand that, okay? That's, that's wonderful that we are possessions of Almighty God. And He cares what's happening with us. It matters to Him. And the conclusion is glorify God in your body. So either you will or you won't heed this. I, I beseech you, don't listen to the world and the enemy. Heed the word of God. There's wonderful blessing in living for the glory of God. If you're here today and you say, I, I hear you talking about being born again, being a Christian, regenerate, I... I can't say that I understand that or I don't know what that is or I've, I don't think that's happened with me. Uh, you need to understand that you only have hope in the person and work of Jesus. That's the only hope you have. His death, burial, and resurrection. His substitutionary death, taking the punishment of sin in your stead. That's the only hope you have of avoiding the wrath of God for sin because he's a perfect judge and he misses nothing. But he's provided a substitute to take the punishment for his people. If you want to know more about that, go around to the Welcome Center or right after the service, come and talk to me. Pastor David is here. We want you to understand that. And then when you follow Jesus, glorify God with your body. Amen. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the reality of our salvation. But Lord, thank you for showing us in your word what you plan for that to mean in our lives, that we live for you and not ourselves, that our bodies are not meant for how we want to use them to fulfill our appetites, but rather they are for you. And Lord, you've provided a perfect plan for how we express who we are sexually and in every other way. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to hear the truth and to obey it. For your glory, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the YouTube channel of Desert Ridge Baptist Church in St. George, Utah. I'm Michael Walter, one of the pastors here at DRBC. We strive for sound doctrine in preaching and teaching and warm fellowship around biblical truth. For more info about DRBC, please visit our website, drbc.us. There you can find helpful links as well as a secure means for contributing financially to our ministry here in this area. Soli Deo Gloria.